I'm Dr. Jerry Hash. Um, I work at Hash Institute in Aurora, Colorado. <clears throat> Excuse me. I got a bachelor's degree in physical therapy in 1981, and I got a master's in health science from the University of Indianapolis, and then a clinical doctorate from AT Still, somewhere in the early 2000s. I'd have to go look at the thing on the wall to tell you when. Um, I am a lifelong learner, and every day I am researching, okay? Um, in 1981, I took a job with Richard Montigny up in Havre, Montana, and uh, I was just fascinated with the SI joint because I had a very blunt injury in which a handlebar gored me, pushing against the pelvic bone here, damaged three very sensitive nerves, and created some instability in both the SI joint and the pubic bone. Now, in that accident, I was going 45 miles an hour. And I started to lose control of the bike, so I put the brakes on and apparently put too much braking on the front and, and dumped the bike. So I went from 45 miles an hour to zero very abruptly. Well, those are the kind of injuries that can cause hypermobility and instability in the SI joint. The SI joint is one of the strongest joints in the human body. It is a shock absorber. It changes the direction of forces from the upper body to the lower body, and during gait and stance, the lower body up, to the, up, up through the SI to the upper body. It dampens shock. And I read that it's a shock absorber, and I thought, well, this is 1981. I thought, hey, I'll test it the way I test a shock absorber on my cars. And when you do that, you push down on the fender until it stops moving. And then the shock is loaded, and you can push on a structure in the human body, such as a joint, until it is loaded. In the car, I then rust it, and if it's not broken, it's going to rust firmly and bounce back. The human body is the same way. Any connective tissue has that same property to varying degrees. And so I developed a large number of orthopedic screening tests to the sacroiliac. Now, <clears throat> orthopedic surgeons have tests that they do, such as to the knee, to test the ligaments of the knee, where they put it in a certain position, they stabilize one bone, and see if the tibia shifts excessively. Tibia should have a little tiny motion, a little bit of spring recoil, but if it's excessive, then that is diagnostic for a damaged anterior bone ligament or any of the other ligaments, depending on the test. So I have a large number of those that I developed. And again, what's really unique at my method of testing is that I allow the recoil to be perceived. All right. So yesterday I had a client, and she appears to have ankylosing spondylitis because there's no spring mobility in the thoracic spine, and there is zero spring motion through the pelvic joints, through the sacroiliac joints. Nonetheless, her pelvis was misaligned. Okay? So when we say my sacroiliac is not out of alignment, and you have a clinician telling you otherwise, they are talking about how the pelvis is oriented in three-dimensional space in various contexts, in standing or sitting, lying on your back, lying on your stomach. But the sacroiliac joint does not drive that movement. The movement of this thing called the pelvis someone is standing up, the weight through the SI joint compresses the SI joint, and it becomes very stable, even with injuries. Okay? So if someone has an uneven pelvis, what's happening? Well, this opening is a pelvis, and the head of the femur goes in there. Well, the whole pelvis has moved on and with the hip joint, the femoral acetabular joint, the femur and the acetabulum hip, okay? And it has moved with 
and in relationship to the trunk and lumbar spine. In sitting, it's true as well. In sitting, you get compression from the seated surface, compressing your S type joint, and you have upper body weight compressing the joint. It's very little movement in that joint, even if you do things like bend forward. It's been measured. It's on the order of less than one to two degrees of rotation in any plane of three, it's a plane of three body, three different directions that moving can happen, and less than two millimeters, so, so small, of glide. Okay, I have looked at thousands of x-rays, CAT scans, and MRIs in patients who walk in the door to see me for treatment, and they think their SI joint is out of alignment, and their pelvis does present asymmetrically, so there's some muscle inhibition on one side and facilitated muscle on the other side, tightness in their hip joint in, a, in one or two directions, etc. Okay? Now, the woman I treated yesterday, in fact, I treated her three days in a row. Yesterday was her last visit. Her SI joint was fused, but her pelvis was out of alignment. Pelvis, not sacroiliac. And I was able to establish symmetry of position of the pelvis. And when I was doing springing of the pelvis, I would see the entire pelvis move, okay? But when I would try to spring specifically through the SI joint, it was as though I was pushing on a brick wall. There was no, none of that play, what we call joint play, none of that load spring recoil, okay? So um, it is helpful when people have relative symmetry in their body, if that's how their body is designed. And people do get pain relief when you balance the body with its design. I do that all day long, every day of the week, okay? But we need to understand that the sacroiliac does not drive the movement of the pelvis, okay? And yesterday's client, on the first visit, I balanced her pelvis. And on day two, it stayed balanced, and on day three, it stayed balanced. But each one of those days, it was obvious to me, this SI joint is fused. Okay, well another problem with people believing that is the clinicians take a two-day course, a weekend course, and it regurgitates old, old information. The osteopathic model of the sacroiliac or pelvis was fully developed in 1958. I can give you that article, Fred Mitchell Sr. And they, they didn't use x-rays and they didn't use CAT scans. We didn't have CAT scans. We didn't have MRIs and we didn't have the best way of testing, which is called stereophotogrammetry, in which they insert pellets in the sacrum and pellets in the, in the, pel in the ilium, the hemipelvis, and stress the joint in different directions and measure motion. Those tests are published in medical literature. You can find them on uh, the government's medical website uh, uh, for articles, for research studies, pubmed.gov. W-W-P-U-B-M-E-D-G-O-V. And I'm struggling a bit. I had no surgery, and I know my face is pretty irritated, and so on and so forth. Bear with me. I'm sorry. I'm trying to make this brief, and it's a difficult subject matter. But if you want to look up studies of the sacroiliac joint, you will find that what I told you is accurate. Now, if you look at studies in which they look at how the pelvis moves, that's a different matter. The pelvis moves in a big way, but that's not coming from motion inside the SI joint. And unfortunately, a lot of clinicians believe they took a weekend course and they believe what they're taught. But it's wrong. They have to dig much deeper into the literature. And I am constantly doing that, and I've done so since uh, I started PT school in 1979. Okay? In Montana, I go for a swim at to work and I go into the library there. They have a wonderful library. So many good journals and I would read, read, read on this and that has continued. Um, some of the problems are the way it is visualized. So people look at the pelvis and they think this is the SI joint back here. No, this is behind the joint and this is full of ligaments, full of ligaments, full of muscle. Okay, well, muscles are enclosed sacs fluid-filled sacs plus muscle, right? 
and you can have more muscle tone on one part of the sacrum and then you palpate it, you know, and the, the motion may not spring through that. And then people say, oh, my SI is out of place. No, no, and no. Okay, no, that's not how it works. And, you know, looking at this retroarticular area and thinking you're seeing the SI tone, oh, that's so wide. No, it's designed that way. The true SI joint is deep to that. Okay, it's in front of my fingers. Okay, and in the front, it is here. Okay. Um, the SI joint is intimate with the hips. You can see on this pelvic model of the hip, uh, the pelvis can move in all different manners, even if the SI joint is stable, is fused. Okay, as a clinician, we really no need to tell our patients the difference between my sacroiliac is, is out of alignment or not out of alignment, and the biomechanics of what's called a pelvis. Okay, and um, uh, I feel very strongly about this, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. You know, someone can interview me for another podcast. We can look at the literature, but just because the therapist does something to you, and visually they say, well, you're more aligned now and you feel better, doesn't prove anything other than the fact that they treated your nervous system, they improved some motion through your body, they may have reduced some muscle inhibition, okay? But they didn't reset the SI joint. And there's this craze of aligning the pelvis on the surgery table and claiming or implying that that aligns your sacroiliac so you have a good surgical fusion, which is absurd. It should not be allowed, okay? Because I cannot visually look at your SI joint. I can't see it. It's so deep. Only the surgeon can see the outline of your, of your SI joint because it is deep inside your pelvis. And he can see it with CAT scan imaging, MRI, okay, and fluoroscopy, especially if he uses dye in the joint. But you can't even see inside the joint with an X-ray. So there's some crazy stuff out there that has persisted. And the better educated we clinicians are, and the less false messages we give our patients, the better off we are at defining what the person presents with, what they need to feel better in their bodies, have less pain, live a more active without crazy concepts. And at the Hesh Institute, I measure every single one of my patients in multiple contexts. And there are two beautiful studies done about 30 years apart, and it looks at the development of the pelvis. Well, 30% of the population has a taller, bony pelvis on one side. Nothing's out of place. The muscles grew in response to that asymmetry. So there's not a core weakness. There's nothing that needs to be aligned. Although, when they sit, if they have a shorter pelvis on this side, when they sit, they'll kind of fall down there and then it changes their posture. And they may be more prone to postural discomfort. So I use a simple little ischial lift you know, a little bit of craft foam and raise that up. So I'm making the chair fit their pelvic, their pelvic asymmetry. But I had a woman who was in tears and she said, every morning I look at myself in the mirror and my pelvis, my SI is out of line. I, you know, and I, and I did my assessment. I'm very thorough. I do head to toe evaluation. And I said, well, you have a little bit of mobility impairment. And here's some simple things we can do to address your back pain but your pelvis grew that way. You know, we don't, have, we don't have a profession called orthopedic plastic surgery that's gonna come and shave off parts of your pelvis, make them even, okay? 
So I showed her how in sitting it may add to, to discomfort if she sits for a long time. She can sit on a wedge under the short side. And I really worked hard to try to get her to understand that. She was in tears. And she said, in the last year, I've seen 10 different clinicians, physical therapists, chiropractors, osteopaths, massage, on and on, on and on. And they all say the same thing. Your SI joint is out of alignment. And they're going to do the magic, and she's going to have to keep going to the magic because they're never going to align it because there's bone that way. Okay? I gave her good information. I thought, I don't think she understands. I don't think she's going to come back tomorrow. I thought I'd lost her. The next day, she comes in, and she is a different person. And she's smiling. I said, well, you look good. What's uh, How are you doing? She says, I get it. I understand. My pelvis grew uneven. It's not the cause of my pain, and I just need to learn how to live with that. And I need to treat my back, um, you know, with a, a few simple movements, maintain normative mobility of my hips and low back. And it's like a huge emotional blow to me as well. So clinicians, please do not tell people your sacroiliac joint is out of alignment by looking at their pelvis. If you want to say your pelvis looks uneven, and then you can do a deeper evaluation, such as the Hess method, and discern if there is a mobility impairment that can easily be treated in the hips, the low extremity, mid-body, upper body, pelvis. Fine. You know, get the balance that you can get. But know when you can't, and, and let's not give them messages that cause them great anxiety, and then they're chasing fusion or spending a whole lot of money trying to stabilize a structure that is already stable, okay? The science is there, and this is an open invitation to every profession that puts their hands on bodies, that, that does surgeries on pelvic joints. Um, so this is a plea to surgeons, it's a plea to chiropractors, it's a plea to physical therapists, massage therapists, body workers, golfers, you name it, what, you know, all the professions, osteopaths, I invite you to dig in the science and examine these precious held beliefs that continue to be per perpetuated and hurt a very vulnerable population. Your sacroiliac joint is not out of the line.